This episode is brought to you by Battleborn Batteries, the best name in the RV and marine industry. These lithium batteries are designed and assembled in the USA, backed by a 10-year warranty. The best solution for your battery anxiety. So go check them out at BattlebornBatteries.com. You are listening to Beyond the Wheel, a podcast about the people and ideas that drive the RV community forward. Hi, everyone. Today, we're joined by Heath Padgett. Many of you already know him from the RV Entrepreneur Podcast, as well as the RV Entrepreneur Summit. Today, we're talking with Heath about his new project, campgroundbooking.com, that he founded with Paul Ryan. Heath talks to us about the challenges of creating a software business from scratch, along with the added challenges of the campground space. This is a much needed piece of software for RVers and campgrounds. He also gives us advice for those listeners that want to become entrepreneurs. So let's jump into the talk with Heath. Hi, Heath, and welcome to the show. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came up with the idea for campgroundbooking.com? Well, the, the story is my wife and I, Alyssa, hit the road like five years ago in 2014. We were looking for campsites out on the West Coast. And basically, we realized that like you kind of have to just like show up at campgrounds to see if there's availability. And I remember specifically it was around like a bunch of like state parks we were trying to get into last minute and just realizing that it was a big pain. But I at the time we were like doing a documentary. We had a lot of other things on our plate. And so the idea of like starting like a online reservation system wasn't really on our radar. Just realized, hey, somebody should do that. And a couple of years later, we were kind of looking for what project was next for us. And um and we were, realized that we wanted to be like in the RV industry for a long time. We like camping. So it's like, hey, if we could find a business to work on in the space, that would be really cool. And I ended up uh, meeting a couple people in our Facebook group, which is called the RV Entrepreneur. Uh, and basically, we decided to start working on a product that could make it easier to find and book campsites. So we didn't really have an idea of what the product was going to be specifically. We just knew that it was a challenge to find and book campsites. Um, and so that was kind of the way we approached it. And after looking at different ways we could kind of go about it, we realized that there were still a lot of mom and pop campgrounds who were operating on pen and paper or Excel spreadsheets or something like that, or an offline older based property management system that doesn't have an API, therefore not allowing online reservation. So in other words, like there's like 13,000 private campgrounds in, um, in the US, not including like public ones. And so we realized, hey, if we want to have like kind of a central online reservation system, why don't we make a really good property management system um, that's based in the cloud and try to get it in the hands of as many campgrounds as possible. Uh, so therefore it will help kind of move towards the being able to go to one site, being, you know, being able to pull up your phone and see like which campgrounds near me have availability and things like that, which was kind of the original pain point that we wanted. So that's what we started working on uh, a few years ago, uh, started like kind of, the first thing we did was go to a bunch of campgrounds and start talking with them about, you know, how, hey, we don't know anything about running a property, but we want to build, you know, a solution, give us feedback. So the first phase was kind of like, hey, we want to learn as much as we can from campgrounds. And then the second phase was building a beta, getting in the hands of different parks to kind of give us feedback. Um, and then we launched in early 2018 with our first park. And now we have, I checked the stats uh, yesterday, we have now had over 14,000 campers book online through campground booking. So that's not counting like the dashboard reservations that campgrounds make over the phone or, or walk-ins or whatever. And then uh, the past few months, we've been processing uh, a little over $200,000 a month through campground booking that like our campgrounds are booking through the platform, I guess, if you will. So there's like, now we're kind of at a place where we've got a, a pretty good application that is running the property. And so it's a property management system, online booking that can run camp run the whole property. So that was a whole lot that I just threw at you, but that's kind of like the backstory <laughs> and, and where, we, where we've gotten to a little bit. No, that's awesome. That's, a, that's a, a lot of information. And the thing that I take away from it right away is that nothing is overnight. So you, you had the idea in 2014, 2000, it took till 2018 to actually implement it into the first campground. Is that something that you were expecting time period wise, or did you think, all right, we're going to get this out and rolled out in the campground sooner or did you expect it to take longer? 
Yeah. So the short answer is I always want everything to be a shorter period of time. I think everybody does. Um, I think this process has taught me patience. So we didn't actually start working on it until I would say seriously until the end of 2016. That's when okay. Paul, my CTO and co-founder who has built our entire application to date, who should probably be on this interview because you know, typically the co-founder who's the more technical one doesn't get enough credit. So I'll just say this, Paul, if you listen to this interview, I'm grateful for you, man. You've built our whole app. He does a really good job. He works really hard. Um, but we didn't really get started getting serious till the end of 2016. Um, it was basically like I met Bob, who was our other co-founder uh, earlier that year. We were kind of kicking around the idea. How are we going to get it started? How are we going to build it? We met up with Paul later that year. And so we actually started working on it. And then 2017 was a, was a challenge because we were like in that phase where we were building this product. And we actually had our first campground come on board that for, in 2016. But uh, the pricing model, we hadn't really figured it out yet. The product was super early. And one thing that we learned was because it's a beat, everyone says like your first version of your product should be embarrassing. And I think that basically if you waited too long, like if, if you're not embarrassed at your first product, you waited too long to ship it or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I would definitely say that that was true for us. And while that might be like a good slogan, it was, it's always hard. It was, it was embarrassing. And so they ended up not sticking around because we didn't have enough to support them. And what we realized was that with a proper, with the application like ours, it needed to be a lot more robust. So like we, we were kind of walking a fine line between we wanted to build something that was very simple for them. That was like a drag and drop. You didn't need to train all your people and spend too much time on it because that's what we were trying to fix for these campgrounds um, because they were using these very complicated systems that were did way too much. They were actually adapted from hotel reservation systems and try to be made for campgrounds instead of like being intentionally designed for campgrounds. So that's what we were trying to do differently. But what we realized was that in order for it to work well, there was a baseline level of features that we needed for them. For example, like campgrounds, uh, majority of them run different seasonal rates throughout the year. So that's nothing new. So you need to be able to like upload a site type to our application and say like, I've got a pull through and back end sites. And those pull through sites are going to be $35 um, during my off season and $45 during my peak season. And the rates, no matter when somebody books online, needs to be reflective of that. But then on top of that, we've also got long or holiday weekends. And in order for those, we, we want to bump up our rates even more. And we actually want to force people to stay three nights. And so what I realized through this process of building software is basically like you're trying to walk this fine line between doing everything like matching the customer's existing processes, but also not waiting forever to launch something because there's going to be so many more features. So kind of the, the line that we've had to walk has been getting enough features to get early campgrounds on board and then trying to work as quickly to build the rest that they need in order to keep going. And so a lot of that's just been communicating with our early campgrounds and saying like, Hey, you're very much partnering with us. It's not going to have everything that you need in the system today, but on the flip side, you will actually get to be able to give us input on how we can make this reservation system really good, which is not something that a lot of, you know, small business has have the opportunity to do because developing software is super expensive. And that's, that wasn't just kind of a platitude that we gave them. Like I just went to Canada and spent a week in two different campgrounds, front offices, uh, shadowing them. Like they have had a direct impact on our, on our application and it's suited to their needs, but also it can be uh, available for a lot of other campgrounds as well. So I would say in short, it's taken a lot longer than I thought it would, but on the flip side, we have been able to get to this point of like decent recurring revenue and a small team without having to raise money. And so we've kind of chosen, Paul and I have been intentional on like, hey, we want to build this business around our lifestyle and not the other way around. And so there's different things that people have as far as perception goes around, whether or not you should build a lifestyle business. Like that's just what makes sense for us. And so in short, we've done a lot of other things to like make money outside of this business so we could keep it going. Um, if that makes sense. I think yeah, that answered I, your question. Kind of long winded. <laughs> Sorry, Kenny. I wanted to touch on something that you said that is pretty unusual, I think, for a software business. And that is, you said you guys didn't raise any money. Is that right? Yeah, it's been 100% bootstrapped to date. So each founder put in like a thousand bucks when we first started. And before we brought on Paul, I met with some angel investors and we're like, hey, maybe we'll get like $50,000 and build a prototype or something of the software and then, and then kind of go from there. But I think what I realized in hindsight was that that would have been a bad idea because somebody like Paul 
he charges probably like 150 bucks an hour for his time. So, and, and that's typical of a developer who has been doing this for a while. Like that, they're not cheap. They build things that scale and that cost money. So therefore, I think what I would have realized and if I would have went that path is that we would have spent that $50,000 and then needed a lot more money in order to get the product that we needed. So it was scary at the time to like bring somebody in at a partner level, knowing that like, you're going to work with this person every day and, and going to give them a big chunk of the business. Now we're equal partners. But at the end of the day, like now I want to have somebody who has the technical chops to build what's needed. And so that, I think if you're starting something like a software and you don't have the technical skills, like you need that partner who's on board that's going to be able to provide those. Otherwise you're going to have to raise like a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But you guys had to essentially keep working on this couldn't be your full-time focus when you were initially getting started because you both had to make money to live basically. So this was kind of an additional, an additional duty, so to speak, to, to get this thing up and running. Totally. Yeah. It's been like a second full-time uh, job essentially. So it's been like a point of uh, stress in some ways, in, in a lot of ways for both of us, just because because like we want to build this bigger thing, but at the same time, like we we're both people who have tried, like we all have who are on this call, like we've all kind of tried to optimize for lifestyle too. So it's been this interesting tension with like wanting to build something that's bigger, but also um, you know wanting to enjoy our day to day. So yeah, in short, for us, like we've done a lot of client projects. Like we've got our blog, Alyssa's done a book. So there's been all these different things that we've done that I would consider my day job to pay the bills. And for Paul, that's been taking you know, long-term or short-term development contracts so that he can like go all in and then maybe he needs to step, take a step back. And we're now at a place where we've got enough traction that we're actually, we just engaged our lawyer. We're doing like a small convertible note to raise for the company. So we're raising like $150,000. I think I can talk about that. I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. Cause it's not like a secret or anything, but we haven't, I guess we haven't really talked about it. So we're going to raise at a point now, but it's at a point where we've got a product that's been in production for almost two years. We've got paying customers. We've got what I would call product market fit. Um, to some extent, there's always more that you can get. Like we've got paying customers. So we've got a lot of things that if we were to try to raise very early on, we wouldn't have been able to show for it, but we've got actual business that's generating revenue. And so I think that it's at a, we're at a place where that's not a crazy hard challenge because of where we've got. And it's more like, hey, we just, we have a core team. And we need to hire another developer to kind of scale up what we've already got. You, you had mentioned, uh, Heath, that you went up to Canada. You spent some time at a campground figuring out what they needed. Is that typical? Are you doing that with all the campgrounds? Is, is each campground getting a customized version of the program? No. So, I mean, with our application, and this is true of most products. So it's like we have our core application, which is, there's the manager side, so which essentially like a campground owner or operator and their team has access. So it's got like the drag and drop dashboard, you check guests in, it's got, you know, where you can list all your sites and how long they are. So when somebody books, it goes on the right sites, they can block it out, it integrates with their QuickBooks, they connect to Stripe so they can take payments. So it does all of that. And essentially, that's the same for every campground. Um, and then they can customize lots of it as far as like, what is their rates? Do they want people to like, book by individual site number 15 or do they want to book only pull through sites and we automatically assign them into a site that fits their RV. So a lot of campgrounds like want to be able to customize all of these different touch points. So essentially it's an application that at, that can hopefully fit a lot of campgrounds at scale. And then you can actually add multiple campgrounds underneath your organizational account. And then the other side of it is like the online reservation flow from the campers perspective. So it's the same application for everybody, but the two parks that I visited were essentially like, they were our two biggest campgrounds. So they both have like over 150 sites each. And our whole idea has been like, one, those are because of our pricing model. Those are the ones that are generating more revenue, but also they are the ones that if we can get the app working really well for campgrounds that are 160 sites operating at 90% capacity to support like a 50 site campground is no big deal because we've got like 15 staff using this login. They've got like a line of 15 RVs. They're checking people in. The whole idea is like optimize for the bigger, the bigger customers. And then like we can accommodate like so many of the other smaller ones to date. So that was why I visited those parks in particular. 
And you guys have done this all while still maintaining your nomadic lifestyle. So you guys haven't been together in an office. It's all been sort of a remote working agreement. Yeah, well, uh, we're stationary for this year, uh, Liz and I, but Paul and I, yeah, it's all been remote. But we have spent some time together, like if we need to jump on a plane to like go visit a customer. We, we don't do it often, but we have done it a few times for like an important meeting or kickoff or something like that. That first year we were working together, he came down and spent a couple of months in Texas in the RV park next to us. And he, uh, Heather and Paul have come to our RV Entrepreneur Summit every year that we've done it. So like we spent time together, but it hasn't been a lot. And it's just been kind of like, hey, we'll park next to each other for a month. And in those times are actually really nice. Like I enjoy getting to like dig into stuff together. But yeah, we're on Slack and we talk like every day, multiple times a day. <laughs> and did you say there's there's three of you involved in the company all together? Uh, now we have five of us, but there was uh, there's two co-founders still involved. We bought out our other co-founder earlier this year. So Paul and I are the two remaining co-founders. Um, the other one got a full-time job. And uh, now we have a support person. Her name's Scarlett. She's awesome. We hired her for after our conference this year. We have It's pretty like intensive from a support standpoint because a lot of parks, like there's an onboarding process and we need to train them and make sure they know how to use the software. Thing. Um, and then making sure that they have like good documentation for like basically customer success role. Um, and then we have a salesperson and then a, co- and then a, a designer. And everyone's contract position. So nobody is full-time, but um, Scarlett and Sean, our support and sales, are pretty close. Why do you think it's taken so long for them to catch up with like the modern reservation systems that the hotels have? Were you able to kind of figure that out as you were developing? I don't know if these are, I don't know if these are the reasons, but the, first of all, there's like over 90% of hotels are claimed, meaning they're part of like a bigger chain. And the chains from the campground perspective all have reservation systems like KOA, Jellystone, et cetera. And, and then even national parks, they all have a reservation system. They use like Reserve America. But the, the thing with the campground industry is that I've heard stats that it's like over 80 or 90% are unclaimed, meaning like they're mostly mom and pop campgrounds. So therefore, like you don't have that same easy de- uh, deploy of reservations to go across. Um, I definitely think that a lot of people who have, who buy campgrounds are it's treated more of like a, a lifestyle business, meaning like you've kind of worked in your job and like you're taking it on like later stage in your career. Um, so there's l- maybe a less sense of like wanting to adopt something new. Another one is like campgrounds are really full already, so there could be a sense of like, hey, if I'm already full, why do I need to like change up all my existing processes to take online bookings? A lot of the parks that we've talked to, though, like whenever they're they're interested in going online, um, but there might be like a hesitation of technology, like, well, maybe their Internet at their park isn't good, which is totally valid. So therefore, like we need a, our grid. If somebody's booking like Site 15, it will show a little gray pending line on the campgrounds dashboard so they don't like take a walk in or phone reservation. And if they don't have access to the Internet on, at their at their place, that would be a challenge. So there's that. And then there's also just the general hesitation of like, hey, um, I want to make sure that, you know, like my park is different and I don't want somebody booked the wrong site. Those are the type of hesitations we started being able to get around because we were like, hey, you can actually let people book by site or by site type. And when you plug in your sites, you make it 40 feet. And if somebody has a 45 foot break, they can't book there. So maybe, so that's been some of them. So I think maybe it's a mixture of all those and some other reasons that I, I, I don't know. This is definitely a welcome change because it is very frustrating to book campgrounds for Sabrina and I, because we're moving so often and so quickly and we'll call a campground. Nobody answers. We leave a message. Nobody calls us back. We'll go online and to to book it like their online booking system now is, oh, write an email to us and we will reply to your email and nobody ever emails you back. And I don't know if it's like what you just said, that maybe they're full and they just don't want to be bothered. But it would be nice to hear, hey, we're we're full. Look somewhere else. Totally, yeah. We had a, one of our parks that came on board. They are in New Brunswick, and New Brunswick was actually creating a provincial law that if you did not take online reservations, they were going to take down your campground signs. Like okay. we're like this exit signs that says like there's a campground over here, which is I don't know that I necessarily agree with that situation, but that was what pushed them into needing to join uh, and take online booking. So they went from like zero online reservations last year 
and we took over uh, seventy percent over seventy percent of the reservations this year were all online. So they basically said, "Hey, like if somebody calls them, they say, hey, go to our website, you know, at this link and book at Ponderosa Pines is the name of the campground and book." And so that's been cool. And they've been able to see people that will like book at seven p.m. and then just like roll into the campground at seven thirty, and their office is closed, and they're like, "Oh." this person was probably just sitting on their phone like 30 minutes away and realized that they could, they had availability, booked a site and came to the park. And so we kept, we kind of like speculated that those might be actual bookings that they wouldn't have gotten because you don't want to drive 30 minutes and not get a site. So therefore it's like, I don't, if, if I don't know if they have availability and nobody answers the phone, then that's a loss of a customer. So the more that we can kind of like share that and get that out there to, to parks, I think, I think will be helpful. Yeah, it's got to be able to increase their business. There's no way it couldn't that I could see anyway. Yeah. What about training with the software? Heath, after they purchase the software from you guys and it's implemented into their campground, what type of training process is there for them? Or is it just kind of very, like you said, drag and drop and it's kind of self-explanatory? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the parks I visited in Vancouver, they said that they were able to get people like training in one day. Like they basically can get up to speed to use the system in one day because it is pretty intuitive. So we do all of the setup for them. So we add in all of their sites. They We give them a format in Google Sheets that's like, hey, add site one through 50 and give us your length and stuff right here. And then we'll like upload that in, in like a CSV type format. Um, and then if they have any reservations, we'll add those in too. And then all of their like, we'll, we'll take a, um, we'll look at all their rates and we'll configure all that for them. They can change it whenever, but that's kind of a little bit of the manual setup and we take care of that. It takes like a couple of days. And then uh, we'll typically schedule like one, if not two video demos on Zoom here before they go live and basically like go through everything to make sure that all their questions are answered. And they've also typically like, then we have some onboarding PDFs that they can check out. That's like, hey, before we go live, like make sure to like take a few test bookings. And then in addition to that, we've been using Help Scout for our support. And then um, with Help Scout, you can have like a, you can build in a little help like section where you create like all kinds of documents and tutorials. So like when a campground now asks for like, how do I make a group reservation, uh, which is a different process than like a normal one, you know, like instead of just replying to them, we're trying to do a better job of like creating a full on like help uh, document that we can like link up to, to build that knowledge base. And Help Scout has this really cool thing that integrates with, you can like plug a line of JavaScript in on our app. And basically it's got like a little question mark now in our app where they can chat with us during business hours. And they can also like view those help documents like in their app screen. So they can like search and be like, Hey, I need help with like, how do you give a refund or how do you cancel a reservation? So in short, we're trying to do like better communication for like training before they go live and then also provide good resources so that even if they're not contacting or talking to us that they're learning and able to do those things but that's a process it takes time to build like a learning base and stuff so being able to jump in at zoom and a lot of campgrounds are really obviously like using the phone still too so you know we do a lot of phone calls and zoom calls and stuff so what what we've talked about so far i think and on this call is uh, the b2b features Mm -hmm. uh, of your software are there also benefits for the customers maybe their information is stored in the system so they can no matter what campground they book at it's they have they have their information stored which makes it a little bit faster than having to enter everything every time yeah so we we do have we're working on camper accounts which is basically just that um until there's kind of a critical mass of campgrounds it's not super useful unless you book at the same campground year over year, which actually, you know, I know that you guys are full timers. And so like, that's not necessarily a thing for you, but the majority of the RV industry, that is actually how they travel. A lot of people go to the same campground every single year. And that's how the majority of people do travel. So, and it would basically allow them to be able to like pull up and sign into their campground booking account and then, you know, not have to re-input all their information. And that's kind of the long-term idea, right. With having a centralized booking site is that once you have enough bookable properties on there, like if you have an Expedia account or an Airbnb account, like you don't have to re-input your rig information or call and give it, you know, the umpteenth time. The short answer is that we're, in order to get to that, we're like trying to build the foundation of like having access to the campgrounds availability in the calendar. And that once we have enough campgrounds on board, it, it becomes more and more useful with like a network effect. I think the main value right now is that like, 
uh, we built mobile responsive first. So in, any of the parks that are using us, like if you go to their website and click on book now, it's you can make a reservation in 60 seconds or less, which is not the case with most sites, even who are using a reservation system. Some of them are some of them are pretty good, but so that's been one thing that we tried to optimize for is that like the value add on saving time, um, which is uh, I don't know if you guys want to get into this, which is how we kind of figured out where our pricing model was going to be and stuff, where we charged like a, a small flat service. So, yeah, so that, I think the time factor is huge, especially like when you said it's seven o'clock at night and you're looking for a place to stay. I want to be able to get on there and grab something as quickly as possible so I can make my way to whatever campground that is and settle in for the night. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Heath, have you uh, encountered anything that you thought was going to be challenging, but went so smooth, you're like, oh, I was sweating over that for no reason? Yeah, charging a $5 service fee. And, that, and that's been easy. Well, as like RVers, we, um, we were really nervous to charge a service fee uh, because we ne- didn't necessarily like paying them. So that was like one thing that we were kind of nervous about. But what we learned was our first year that we had paying customers, they were paying us like a setup fee and a monthly fee for the software. But the problem was they were seasonal park. And so they were only using the software like six to seven months out of the year. Another problem for us, this wasn't their problem was that like we weren't charging enough for the monthly service to rationalize how much support that they needed. Also, the more people that booked through the site, the more that our costs grew both in servers and support. So Essentially, what we realized was at that point, we either needed to charge like two, three hundred bucks a month for the software, which is a lot for a lot of small businesses and charge like a bigger setup fee. Or we needed to have a pricing model that scaled with how many customers were booking on the site. And so essentially, we we ended up going with the free model. So the campground gets the whole software system for free, no setup. We do all that for them. And then they get 100% of their booking, whatever their rate is for their sites, they get 100% of that. So if the site's 30 bucks a night, somebody goes online to book it, they pay their 30 bucks, the campground gets all of that minus any credit card processing fees, which is standard no matter where you book. And then we charge a $5 fee on top of that that the campground. So essentially, that was something we were really nervous about. And for a long time, I was very back and forth on. But once it went live, like nobody has really said anything at all. And it went really smooth. And I think why I realized it, that it went smooth is like it provides value for everybody. Like we cover our costs that if a camper has a technical question or an issue when they're booking and they need to contact us, we're covered from that time perspective. The campground saves like anywhere from five to 15 minutes, however long it would take over the phone. They don't have to ask for a credit card over the phone, which is not secure. And then the camper doesn't have to like call in either and go through that process. So they are able to save that five to 10 minutes that is sometimes spent when you're trying to like call or get in touch with them. So to me, it was like kind of a value add for everyone involved. And if the camper didn't want to like pay a service fee or they're like, I don't want to pay the $5 USD or whatever for a ser- for that, um, we don't actually don't charge for like a walk-in or an over-the-phone reservation. So we don't make anything on those. So our whole value proposition for the campgrounds um, is basically like, we'll save you time and help you boost occupancy through online reservations. And if we're not operating in that core value prop, then we're not making money. So we're charging for the things where we're providing the most value. Do you see that as a long-term revenue generator or would you, will you have to change your, your model as you grow? Um, what do you mean? Like, well, that let's say you now processing a million and a half in revenue per month. Will that $5 service fee that you charge cover that? The, the work that you have to do when you get to be that large or will you will you have to restructure somehow totally. yeah totally it will it will i mean that's part like there's a there's there's enough margin there that it covers it um i think the 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 fine line is that we don't want to be greedy with whatever service fee there is there because those are direct bookings that the campground we didn't send them those bookings so with air, things like airbnb their marketplace. So they're actually cutting in like, I don't know the exact amount, but it's it's a percentage on both sides, meaning their charger, the person booking and they're charging the person listing. So typically it's somewhere between like 20%. Mm-hmm. So we're getting nowhere in that range, but we're also not providing the traffic, the campground is. That means uh, that we also, okay. yeah. So, so in other words, like if we were doing the marketing to earn them additional bookings, then that would not be enough. And so we actually do 
like our company is actually no matter reservations. I know everything's campground booking, but that's a product underneath our company. And we actually have um, another product, which is a white label version of our campground listings, which is used by GoRV in Canada, Travel British Columbia, a couple like high traffic camping sites. And so basically they are charging a percentage. So they're charging seven and a half percent, but they're spending money on like, they're spending tens of thousands of dollars on like promoting listings and they're giving, they're getting over a hundred thousand monthly visitors and they're getting a lot of exposure to the parks. So if somebody books through one of those partners, then it's a different feed because basically they're like, Hey, we earned it. We, we brought you this person that you wouldn't have gotten. Um, but even in those scenarios, like the campground is not having to like give a cut. So it doesn't really matter. That's the other been the other interesting thing about this space is that unlike hotels, another reason why I don't think it's caught on because there's not as much margin, like a $150 night hotel room. If you're Expedia, you can, you can make a decent margin on that. And they, they do, but with a campsite, it's like, like if I'm, if I'm a campground owner and I'm listing on like booking.com, you know, I don't have 10 to 15% margin to give up. So I think that's been another area. It's like maybe some of the reasons these OTAs, online travel agencies haven't been as adept at getting in here because it's a totally different kind of space on like what they're willing to give up from a, from a commission standpoint. Let's switch a little bit now and go to how you're marketing this software. Um, It sounds like you guys did a lot of work on the front end before you even started developing it to figure out how exactly you needed to build it. And and now how are you selling it? Yeah, so we've probably spent about 95% of our energy on the product. So the short answer is we haven't really went really deep on marketing the product just yet and, and pushing it, putting it out there. Maybe part of it being like insecurity, other part of it just being a little bit of fear. But I think a lot of it stems from wanting to make sure the product is in a really good place and that it's actually better than what's out there. So that's where we spend a lot of our time is actually just working to get the product in as good a place as possible. Because if you're providing like a lot of support and you're like, Hey, this thing isn't working as it should, then you need to spend time like getting that thing operating. And we're just now at a place like over the past few months where we've really started thinking about like, what can we start doing to really get this out there? So we've, we started doing a few things. The biggest thing that we've done is we have formed partnerships with uh, large campground associations. So we're the official campground booking partner of Canadian Campground Association and the BC Lodgings Association and GoRV in Canada. And this, the Canadian Campground Association is, is headed by a guy named Shane, and they have about 2,000 campground members. So essentially, oh, wow. uh, we're, we're kind of working with them um, and their members to create a product that's, that's kind of a value add for everybody. And that's why, like, that's why there's a partnership there. So that's been kind of helpful too, because we can kind of leverage those relationships with those guys and, you know, share how we can help their, their parks through a reservation system and try to create like value all the way around. So we've gotten quite a few parks. That's why we're pretty concentrating in Canada, just because like we built some of those relationships and they're like, Hey, we're working with campground booking. They're developing this reservation system in partnership with us and um, you should sign up. And so we've gotten quite a few referrals from those partners I recently started buying some Google ads, uh, which has been helpful. And we've started getting more parks in the U.S. We just had a park sign up in Florida, had one reach out in California and Texas this week. And so we just started like buying ads on like campground reservation software. And um, that's kind of competitive because there's a lot of softwares out there right now that are trying to buy those. But it seems to be converting decent because our name is is pretty good um, as far as like a the scripture. So, so I think, I think Google has been kind to us because like campgroundbooking.com, it sounds like bit and stuff. So we started getting some decent traffic from that perspective. So those are a couple of ways. And then we started doing a little bit of direct sales through uh, Sean, who's on our team, just like reaching out and calling parts and kind of get them on the phone and seeing if we could be a good fit for them. Uh, and so we have some different ideas for what we want to do moving forward. Uh, we're talking about like right now we're trying to figure out how we can work with people who are full timing and traveling around campgrounds who are interested in like being affiliates or partners for us. And we actually had quite a few people reach out over the past couple of years of like interested in like, Hey, this camp, I want to like help get more parks online. Like, can I be an affiliate? And we hadn't really went down that route because we wanted to be product to be really good and something that people were proud to like partner with. Um, and now that we're, we feel like we're at that place where we want to figure out how we, we also know what we can pay to partners like that. So we're trying to figure out, Hey, 
you know, like if you want to go out to a campground and be an affiliate for campground booking, we'll pay you like 250 bucks. So we're trying to figure out what that looks like. Yeah, I, I would like to hope or think too that customers uh, that have used the program to book a campground will maybe go to another campground and say, hey, you know what? I, 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 I stayed with you this uh, at a different campground and it would have been so much easier if you guys would, you know, implement this program it may, you know, that I used at another campground. I don't know if that's something that could happen, but that word of mouth is always very strong. And, and Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good note. I, I just don't know how you make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to think about that. Because it is. It is so frustrating as RVers to try to book. When you, when you talk about that $5 surcharge, I, I'm like, man, that's a no-brainer. For five bucks, I can book online in under 60 seconds and be completely done with it and not call or email six different campgrounds in an area and never hear anything back from them. That's yeah, I, I think that's awesome. Totally. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the big, the bigger challenge will be trying to deploy it at scale and see like how many parks can we get signed up and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of like where we're at now. So, yeah. So it sounds like development is still in process and probably will be, for quite some time as you're, as you continue to learn what campgrounds need. Yeah. I mean, I think development is never ending for any software product. I think we've kind of hit a place this year where there's the product has went through so many iterations and there's kind of some technical things that we had to do to scale up our servers. There's, um, there's like a specific term uh, that Paul uses when it's I'm trying to think of the word, but anyway, for most people, they wouldn't care anyway. But being able to accommodate, like, whenever campgrounds go live to take bookings and there's an influx of traffic, you know, being able to accommodate and not have things slow down or being able to get certain features live that we knew we needed to get for the majority of parks. Um, and so we're, we're at that place now. And now it's more about kind of shifting. And I've talked with other software founders who kind of get go through these different phases. Like, for a season, you're in, like, we're trying to build a lot of features to to get where we need to be. And then you kind of, and then it goes more into like, hey, the product's pretty good with where it's at. And now we need to shift to do more sales. And so now that's kind of where we're getting to, like the product's getting to a place where we've got most of the features we need for 75% of parks. Now we need to go get more parks on the platform. And then maybe, you know, once after like a period of time of doing that, we'll come back and revisit the app and say, hey, we really need this if we want to go after those like remaining portion of where where do you hope to see campgroundbooking.com in the next three to five years? Yeah, I mean, I hope that on our reservation system, my goal is, our, our like dream goal is that we have at least like 500 campgrounds in the next few years. So that's kind of like the goal we're working backwards from, which is a lot. But at the same time, um, we've built something that has that potential to scale now. Like we don't necessarily have to do a lot of extra work to to add a new park on is like not a big deal with where we're at now. Like we don't need to change up our servers or anything like that. Um, that's kind of the beauty of software. It's like once you go through the hard part of developing it. So I, I think that's where I would really like to be is to be able to get as many parks online as possible over the next few years. And then, um, you know, continue to try to provide more value to in campers who are, who are booking as well. I'm curious. So is campgroundbooking.com a company that you are building to run for as long as you can, or is it a company that you are trying to scale up to sell later as a completed product? Gosh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think um, yeah, the, that's a good question. At different times, I've had different answers, and that's been something that's been on my mind a lot this year. I think the bigger thing that is a dream of Alyssa's and mine to take a step back is that we really want to buy a campground. And my bigger dream is that we want to provide a really cool campground experience for people that helps people like get outside, kind of provides the experience of the RV Entrepreneur Summit, but at a campground. We host events, we have co-working space, we have fiber internet, like people can use it as, you know, like a, a base to explore. And so that's been something that a few different people in the industry, I think, are excited about and want to do. Um, and I, I think as many people who want to start campgrounds like that, that would be amazing. And that's something that we're really passionate about. So I think in a dream world, over like in the next couple of years, we're able to buy a property, invest in one with some partners, and that we can build what we hope is like a really great campground experience. And at the same time, continue improving this product as like something that's happening in parallel, meaning like maybe I'm not doing everything day to day. Um, and I've got a team as we continue to grow. And that we can kind of shift into actually more like 
providing cool experiences at a campground in a fit in person type of thing. So I think if we can get to that point, then I could see me doing this for, for a long time. I know life doesn't always work out as, as you plan. So that could totally change. I've always liked the idea of selling a business. Um, but for now it's, it, it will be fun to continue running it independently. What type of advice, let, let's say your top two pieces of advice that you would give to somebody that's wanting to start a business from scratch since you guys have done it really without even any outside investing, which I find just is unbelievable. But what, what two pieces of advice would you give to someone who is interested in, in, in sort of replicating what you guys have done? Yeah, I'd say the first one is um, a few years ago, I was talking to my friend Kevin Holish and he, I was like, I was really excited about going all in on campground booking. And he was like, hey, dude, continue doing everything you're doing with client projects and with your blog and everything else because founders, uh, companies don't run out of money, but founders do. And I thought, I think that that was very wise advice because it's, it's very accurate. And especially with software, but really any business is probably going to take three X longer than you think it's going to take. So therefore, like if you don't have enough financial runway in the bank, you just can't have enough opportunities to do what you want to do. So I think for me, like my advice would be if you're doing this on the side, then make sure that you have enough revenue coming in or enough in the bank to sustain for much longer than you think. Because once you get to that point of like desperation, it, it's bad for you, it's bad for your partner, it's bad for your spouse and your family and everyone else involved. So I think to me, that's something like I've tried to be really thoughtful of because it, that's a big challenge. And then another piece of advice, it would be like, this is kind of generic. So it is what it is, but I, I think it's been helpful. It's like to not compare yourself to like other entrepreneurs. Like for me, I, I'm really proud of the progress we've made, especially in this past year. But I've also looked at people who like raised lots of money and then like went to go build something. And, you know, like in four years, it was worth like tens of millions of dollars. So for me, my struggle has been like trying to compare our bootstrapped efforts while doing like a lot of different things and not doing this all in all the time with lots of resources to those people, which is just really ridiculous. Yeah, that's um, apples and oranges, really. Exactly. It totally is. But at the same time, it's like, and I'm sure other people may struggle with something similar. So I think for me, it's like, if you decide to bootstrap, recognize that it's going to take a long time. And I think that that's okay. And it's just kind of like mapping your ambition back to like, are you okay with like things taking a lot longer? And for me, I've had to learn how to be patient and know that like, especially with it being one guy, my, my partner and Paul likes to say, he's like, I can build anything, but not all at once. And so for me, it's been trying to figure out like, how do you, pre and those are good helpful exercises. I think when you're building a business too, it's like you learn what is the most important thing and it helps you to be creative. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to watching campgroundbooking.com grow. And I think that is all of our questions for you right now, but is there anything else that you would like to add or anything that you think that we might've missed? I actually have one more, Kenny, before we okay. let See? him do that. So for, for um, campground owners that are listening to this, how do they find out more information about this product? Yeah, so we have, um, if you, campgroundbooking.com is like all the information about the product. My email is heath at campgroundbooking.com. Yeah, if you're listening, we'd love to work with you and see if we're a good fit. All right, and we'll, we'll put links onto our show notes and they can contact you this way or that way for anybody that's listening also. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks, Heath. It's great to have yeah. you on the show. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. A lot of information yeah. too. It's great. Thanks, yeah. man. Yeah, thank you so much. You bet, guys. We want to thank Heath for coming on the show. It was so much fun chatting and learning his process of building a successful business from scratch. We really do look forward to seeing the company grow as it will be beneficial for all our viewers. We wish Heath continued success and safe travels. We hope you enjoyed this episode and ask if you could leave a review on your listening platform. These reviews help the show get ranked and suggested. Plus, we like to read them as well. So take care, everyone, and safe travels. This episode is brought to you by Battleborn Batteries, the best name in the RV and marine industry. These lithium batteries are designed and assembled in the USA, backed by a 10-year warranty. The best solution for your battery anxiety. So go check them out at battlebornbatteries.com.